everybody a quick note about our precision medicine training program. It's been a really popular course. We're constantly hiring health coaches and physicians, but we're only hiring them as we grow if they're trained in precision medicine. You don't get that in medical school or other places. And so we've developed this training program and we've completely revamped it recently. It's a lot more robust. So now there's still over 50 hours of live synchronous training. There's also all the asynchronous credit over 50 hours of content. Um, And as a physician, you get about 50 hours of AMA Category 1 CME credit, which is a nice benefit for the health coaches going through the training program. It's now accredited by the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaching. So graduates are going to meet the requirement to sit for the board exam and become board-certified health coaches. There's a lot of benefits to that, not just certification, but also when it comes to things like insurance reimbursement. So it's a really robust program. If you're a physician, a nurse practitioner, a PA, or someone that just wants to be a health coach, um, it's open to all of those categories. There's the six-month program that's kind of the full program. And then we also have just a fundamentals of precision medicine course, which is completely on your own. It's online. It's all asynchronous. You still get the 50 hours of AMA Category 1, but it's self-paced. And you still have access to the online community, but not all the synchronous lectures as well. So if you're interested in checking that out, go to wildhealth.com forward slash education. And we'd love to have you as part of our next class. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Wild Health Podcast. Mike Mallon here today with Emily Johnson from Very. Uh, now, Very is an interesting company that is focused on something that is, I know is near and dear to all of our listeners' hearts, and that's metabolic health, which is obviously a huge driver of disease, um, a huge driver of longevity if it's in the right direction, or a lack of longevity if it's in the wrong direction, um, and something that we're obviously super, super excited about talking about with, uh, with Emily um, so Emily is a registered dietitian. She's the research lead at Vary, um, and she has background in nutrition science and uh, behavior change, which is obviously a huge part of eating healthy and having having uh, metabolic health. So she's working at the intersection of um, health tech and research to translate scientific evidence into meaningful, sustainable action for daily life. Emily, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. I'm really excited to be here and chat with you today. I am too. Um, I want to talk today a little bit about um, sort of a background of metabolic health. I think most of our listeners have some understanding, but maybe don't understand the nuance um, that can be associated with metabolic health in general. Um, So uh, talk a little bit about measuring and managing metabolic health. I want to talk about um, eating specifically with the goal of metabolic health in mind. And then I want to talk a little bit about Viri and sort of Viri's approach to metabolic health in general. So if all that sounds good to you, maybe we can start with just what does it mean to be metabolically healthy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a great question and a great place to start because I think even when you Google it now, if somebody's curious, um, you're going to find a lot of different answers, answers that maybe overlap a little bit, but aren't the same. So it can be kind of a confusing um, field. And this term is is relatively new. People are sort of taking note of the idea that um, metabolic health is something that we should pay attention to. So I'll start with the clinical definition, um, which is centered around what, what now we are calling metabolic syndrome. So there are five markers of metabolic health that you can get in a combination of a blood panel, doctor's visit, something like that, which is your glucose levels, your HDL cholesterol levels, your waist circumference, your blood pressure, and your triglycerides. And having three or more of these um, is indicative of metabolic syndrome, which really is kind of an interesting syndrome because it's a cluster of symptoms that can put you at risk for more chronic conditions down the road. So things like diabetes, things like heart disease, stroke, or or all three. So it's, it's sort of a, a big warning sign, right? And each one of these things, um, while on their own might not be the worst thing, it, it really can be something that is indicative of, hey, I'm sort of headed down the wrong path when it comes to my health and going in the wrong direction, right? So even if you have one of these markers. Um, Now, another thing we're seeing a little bit more, and this is maybe not the clinical research definition as much, is in the CGMs for non-diabetic space, which is the space that Vary operates in, um, we sort of have this new method of looking at our metabolic health and hopefully precluding getting to the markers, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes sort of thing, which is 
the CGMs are allowing us to see our minute to minute glucose data. And in other words, we're seeing our glucose variability. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, I think that's all really exciting. And, and really what we're trying to do is sort of expand that definition of metabolic health to yes, be the clinical, but also be how can I have a long life? How can I have a healthy life? How can I have a life that I enjoy and enjoy it in good health? Yeah, I think, you know, you mentioned the clinical definition there and, and no surprise, the clinical definition frustrates me quite a bit um, because it, it's it's this idea <laughs> of, of black and white, right? Like as if, you know, something suddenly happens and you have three or five markers and all of a sudden you're metabolically unhealthy when, you know, in reality, obviously everything is a spectrum um, in medicine, uh, especially. And, um, uh, you know, there's clearly a you know, you can not have metabolic syndrome and still be metabolically healthier than someone else who doesn't have metabolic syndrome, right? I mean, there's a, there's a spectrum here and, and we want our patients to be on the very far end of, of metabolically healthy, um, which, which is measurable and it's measurable by looking at, you know, not just these markers, but, but you know, other data, for example, continuous glucose monitor data can be really helpful in understanding people's ability to respond, um, to their diet and respond to carbohydrates in their, in, um, in their diet. Um, so collecting all this data is, is obviously very important. Now, when, you know, I think there might be a bit of confusion around metabolic health, its definition and how insulin resistance plays a role, right? So, you know, I think some people will interchange the two, the two words sometimes, which is maybe fair, maybe not. I'm curious as to your, your take on this. What, what is the relationship of how glucose and blood sugar play into metabolic health? Um, yeah, that's another awesome question. And I think, you know, to, to say what you said about the the spectrum kind of thing, that's like our whole thing at Vary is like too many people, you know, patients, things like that are maybe having some of these markers come up and the doctor's going, oh, your cholesterol is a little high or, oh, your blood pressure is a little high. And maybe it's not even medication worthy or maybe they do put them on medication, but they're not really telling them how to do anything about it. Right. They're just sort of like, take this, take this. And you're, again, headed down this path towards poor metabolic health, or you do have poor metabolic health, but you're not really understanding the the gravity of that situation. So I'm, I'm totally with you. We're trying to kind of help people benchmark themselves on that spectrum and take action before they're on the um, negative extreme of it. But yeah, so to talk a little bit about, um, you know, glucose, insulin resistance, metabolic health, those kinds of things. Again, it's sort of this cluster of symptoms. And obviously, um, glucose and insulin sort of work in tandem for a healthy metabolism. I know you've talked about this a bit on previous episodes, but you know, you eat food, uh, carbohydrates are broken down into the simplest unit, which is glucose. Um, and that's going to fuel your body, right? So that your cells can produce ATP for energy. So, you know, there is sort of this we don't want to have a uh, a negative view of all glucose is bad, right? Or carbs are always going to be broken down into glucose, and that's okay. Your body needs that. Um, and insulin is the hormone that responds um, in order to, uh, you know, in simple terms, unlock your cells so that the glucose can go in and be used effectively. Um, and while these things work together, that mechanism can become dysregulated over time. And sort of all these sort of uh, markers we mentioned in the clinical definition are interrelated and can start to affect that mechanism. There's a ton of other things that can affect that mechanism. And also, um, there's a lot of research out there that shows that these two things, while in their best case scenario, in a healthy person, they're working sort of in concert with one another to manage your blood glucose levels in your body. You know, there are certain foods that can like have a high insulin response, but you're not going to see your glucose change too much. Or um, maybe someone has this sort of glucose dysregulation where they're starting to have these poor reactions or poor glucose response to eating certain types of carbohydrates, but they haven't gotten to a full place of, of insulin resistance yet. So all of that to say it plays into metabolic health, but these are almost like, you know, cogs in the machine that is your metabolism. And we want all of them functioning well, and each one can break individually. And of course, if one of them is starting to break down, it's going to eventually affect the other part, even if it's sort of working well, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Totally. Thank you. So in this, obviously, an important area, what can what can listeners do in order to evaluate their overall metabolic health? You know, I guess uh, one thing you mentioned, you can obviously be evaluated by a physician, get a you know, lipid panel and blood pressure and all those things. What, what else can they do to, to take a look and see how their metabolism is functioning? 
Yeah, that's a that's a great thing. Uh, you know, I know, like you said, A1C is kind of the gold standard. If you're Googling, you're going to see that as far as like, hey, that's what is my blood sugar doing over time? Um, right now, blood sugar is kind of the main way that at least clinically is used. Um, insulin tests or uh, circulating insulin tests are becoming more common. Some of our um, users want to do things like that. Now, the thing with that is that it's a little more challenging because of the fact that there aren't as many um, universal uh, sort of universal um, parameters for what regular circulating insulin should be. Um, I'd be curious to your thoughts on that as a, as a physician as well. But, you know, my understanding is that's not as um, not as available. Um, obviously, people can use finger sticks at home. That's something that diabetics use. But also, obviously, continuous glucose monitoring can kind of evaluate your metabolic health, evaluate your glucose levels, and kind of start to show you how your body, your meta, your metabolism is responding to food activity. You know how your stress levels, how your sleep are kind of affecting the way your body's responding to what you eat. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take the bait. We so we look at a lot of things for, um, <laughs> for metabolic metabolic health in general. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, fasted insulin levels. We do look at fasted insulin levels as well as hemoglobin A one C. Hard not to look at that. Fasting glucose is ob obviously you know useful, but not not that helpful because it's affected by cortisol release early in the morning or coffee things like that will affect things. Timing, yeah. all that stuff. Um, we uh, we also look you know we, we look at something called a metabolic Z score, which is uh, a combination of all of those things that you described that are in the diagn diagnosis for metabolic syndrome. So we look at sort of the Z score of where people fit against the population is all that is it's just a population based percentile for the most part. Um, and then we also look at um, look at the lipids. So uh, rather than just look at HDL and triglycerides, you can actually look at the size of LDL particles, um, the amount of VLDL particles, and those things can help you discern whether somebody has um, early metabolic syndrome. Um, so smaller LDL particles tend to lean towards metabolic syndrome, for example. And some labs will actually give you an insulin resistance score associated with the, with the lipids, which we use a good bit too. I also really like glucose tolerance tests, but frankly, they're just super hard to get on people. Um, you know, like they're really yeah. helpful. So, you know, instead of doing the official lab glucose tolerance test, we put a CGM on people and then have them have them eat either do a actually direct, you know, sort of unofficial glucose tolerance test where you take in the dextrose and then see what the CGM does. Yeah. Um, or just look at, you know, how they're responding to, to foods, knowing, knowing what they're eating. So, um, yeah, I guess I took the bait on that one. That's, that's how we address it. But I mean, I think hopefully that, that, um, um, uh, proves the point that this is super complex. Like there's not one test that just says like, yeah. you have insulin resistance or you have metabolic syndrome, right? Like that, like there, there's not one test that puts you on that spectrum in a very uh, discernible way early on in the disease process, which is what I think we're all looking for. Right. Yeah. And from what I hear from people too, you know, you've mentioned all these things, which are amazing. And it's so great to see, obviously, uh, progress and more ways that we can kind of triangulate symptoms or triangulate markers. But I think, generally speaking, a lot of people, at least that come to us only have an A1C, and are like, my doctor said I'm pre-diabetic, but I, that was it. Like, it was not really even like a, a longer conversation or anything like that. So to your point, kind of like, what more information can I get from my body? How can I understand this better? How can I avoid this, right? These aren't as common of uh, clinical tests, at least as far as, as we've seen um, right now, but. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about nutrition um, and metabolic health. Um, what are, um, yeah. what are some of the influenceable um, factors um, specifically food, I guess, um, that affect, affect metabolic health? Like, how do you think about in general overview? <laughs> Cause I know this is a complex topic, you know, food and its effect on metabolic health. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, I think we've sort of already hinted at this or said it, but obviously what you eat can negatively or positively sort of support impacts your metabolic health. Um, I think there's sort of a few broad things, which is obviously like what you're eating, the quality of it, um, how much you're eating, right. Um, which, you know, becomes more or less important based on truly what you're eating. Uh, the, the time that you're eating, um, what you're eating together, right? Certain foods eaten together can be more beneficial to you. Um, and also just, um, 
Yeah, the, the I guess those are the those are kind of like the main ones, sort of like what you're eating, when, how you're eating it uh, is is probably most important. And there's there's general guidelines here, right? Like um, carbohydrates by themselves um, tend to spike, you know, your blood glucose more um, theoretically, giving you more insulin release, right? Um, you know, add in some protein or some fat, and you sort of slow the digestion. Um, so, like, there's definitely there's generalizations that I think we can tell everybody that are for the most part true, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's good to practice. It's good to practice with these things. It's good to have the balance plate, like all those things that that sort of general uh, blog advice, if you would want to call it that. But I think what's useful about having a CGM or having something that's giving you real time feedback is that you can see if that's true for you, right? And like mm -hmm. we're in the uh, industry of more personalized healthcare, personalized nutrition, wh whatever you want to uh, refer to it as. But I think that's what helps you be like, okay, cool. I'm going to take this general advice. I'm going to tweak it, make it work for me and make it be something that is like you actually know is or is not serving you and you can take action on it then. Yeah. I remember the first time I used a CGM, um, like the first two weeks there was, I don't know, a hundred different aha moments, you know, these like moments where you yeah. realize like, Oh, yeah. that doesn't work for me. Okay. I guess maybe I'll stop eating oatmeal every morning to break my fast. <laughs> like, yeah. That's, that's just not a good solution. I don't want a blood sugar of 180, you know, like it, it's amazing how, you know, you think, you think you're eating something, um, that is metabolically healthy and then the CGM just slaps you in the face. <laughs> it's like, Nope, no, nope, yeah, it can you. definitely yeah. be, Definitely be a wake up call or, or at least, uh, some, some interesting info. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. Um, so if you don't have a CGM, um, what are some general, you know, general guidelines that we can, that we can give people to make sure that they're getting, you know, not just metabolically healthy diet, but also still getting, you know, appropriate amounts of nutrients. Um, because it's, it's easy to, even when you put slap on a CGM to just think, you know what, I'm just going to stop eating carbohydrates, <laughs> you know, like yeah. I'm going to fix this number on the screen. Is that always the right thing to do? Or are there, are there other solutions out there? Yeah. I mean, I, the caveat being like, look, we want to support people the way you want to eat. So if you're like a diehard keto head, knock yourself out. Right. And, and we can yeah. still help you. But I think for the most part, most people who are coming to us or, or in this space want to get healthier, but they're not like, looking to go extremo um, necessarily. So I think first and foremost, like super simple, but like eat a colorful diet, eat a broad diet, try to get, when I say colorful, right? Like try to get all different color fruits and vegetables, um, try to get your lean protein in there, uh, making sure that you're having different macros at each meal, right? Your meal isn't just protein, isn't just carbohydrates, right? Try, or just fat, trying to sort of balance those things um, and, and, diversify uh, is really important and going to get you a breadth of micronutrients. Um, certainly supplements are an option. Um, I am not in any stretch against supplements, but I do think that, you know, our culture has like perhaps a bit of an over-reliance on them for a lot of people who are healthy. Um, if you don't have a illness, deficiency, something like that, uh, a medication that you're taking that might be affecting that, like you're just going to excrete the excess, you're going to pee it out, right? You, you should be looking for whole food sources um, that are going to get you that that diverse diet. So I think thinking about like high fiber foods, um, thinking about plant foods, and that doesn't mean you have to be vegan, but those are good things to try to use as a guidepost for like, hey, I want to make sure I have this at every meal. Fiber, uh, plant-based foods, and, and lean protein is a good sort of like general rule of thumb. What about, what about food timing? Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, excitement around time restricted feeding around fasting, um, whether that has an impact on metabolic health, are, are there any specific recommendations that you get, would give someone or considerations of how you might devise a, um, food timing plan for somebody? Yeah, so fasting really can be great. There's a lot of um, research to show that it can help, especially if people do have insulin resistance, are looking to lose weight. Um, and, and really, it's just that fasting, in a lot of ways, there's no magic to it. It's just that you are calorie restricting, um, but you're not doing the I'm calorie counting on my app, right, or whatever it may be, or, or trying to stick to that exact number. So, you know, you fast overnight, you maybe add a few hours on the end of every 
day or the morning and, and you're spending more time where you are depleting, um, you know, you're, you're getting rid of your glucose in your body, your body's using it up, you're using your glycogen stores, and you're perhaps starting to burn, burn fat. So that's why a lot of people see um, weight loss with it. And so it's, again, I, I would say like, if that's something you want to do, it's totally worth a try. You have your CGM, you can kind of see how your blood sugar is responding. I think it's very interesting to see after fasting, how your blood sugars respond the next day, because if you are using up the glucose um, in that is stored or starting to burn some fat, you can kind of increase your metabolic flexibility and you may see better glucose numbers um, over time, but also, you know, the following day in an even smaller way of doing that is, you know, I think Americans have a very snack driven culture. Um, trying to increase the time between meals is sort of like a mini fast, if you will, and, mm -hmm. and can even help if you're somebody who's like really frequently snacking and always keeping your sort of like glucose and glycogen topped up. Um, so that can be a great way to just get started if you're not like into the fasting thing. Um, the one thing I will say is like, sometimes it can be doesn't work as well with women. Um, there's some research to show that, you know, um, around menstrual cycles, around menopausal women, it may actually put some stress on your body. So again, it's like something to experiment with. Um, you don't want to go crazy overboard with it, especially if you're just getting started, but it definitely can be something that's useful and helpful in people trying to manage blood glucose, um, improve insulin sensitivity. Uh, yeah, have, have better, better sugars, better metabolic health. Okay. So maybe something to reach for if you're interested, but not necessarily a requirement um, for for overall metabolic health. W what if someone is not just interested in being metabolic healthy, but they've actually got some metabolic dysregulation already, and um, they're looking for a new diet slash eater eating pattern? I hate to use the word diet. Um, that uh, you know, what what would you that to help their metabolic health? What what would you reach for? What are your what are the eating patterns that you reach for on a regular basis for people who are metabolically dysregulated? Yeah, um, I think that, again, I, I feel the same way about the diet thing. I think it's about lifestyle, right? So anytime you're going hard out on some sort of diet plan, it's usually not long term and usually not going to solve the problem long term. Uh, but Mediterranean diet is is really a great baseline for a lot of people. Obviously, the DASH diet is sort of a low sodium diet. It's sort of a Mediterranean diet adjacent. Um, obviously, if you already have some Medi uh, Mediterranean, if you already have some metabolic dysregulation and you may have any like con comorbidities as far as cardiac or blood pressure, like DASH might be better for you. But I think Mediterranean is a great place to start. I feel like Mediterranean diet also includes a lot of foods. Um, it's really high in what I already talked about, which is fiber, diet diversity, and and lean proteins. So it's a good like place to start and to see what foods are included in there that you can kind of play around with and include. Fiber, diet diversity, and lean protein, all, all, all things in the American diet for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we get tons of those, right? Yeah. 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 Um, Talk to me about mindful eating. What's your take on mindful eating? I know this is maybe a little off topic for us, but um, I'm, I feel like it's been blowing up my Instagram recently. Um, uh, what's the benefit there for thinking um, about being mindful while you're eating? Yeah, so I think um, also, uh, you know, as we both probably are aware for people that we see, um, everyone's always doing two things at once to minimum, right? We're, we're on the phone while we're eating lunch, we're at our desk while we're eating lunch, we're watching TV while we're eating, whatever the thing may be, right? So you're kind of distracted from what you're doing, which is eating your food. Um, and, and mindful eating is sort of actually focusing on the process of eating rather than um, what a lot of diets tend to do, which is focusing on the outcome, right? Whether it's, I want to gain muscle, I want to lose weight, blah, blah, blah. We're looking for an outcome. We're trying to achieve something with our food. Whereas uh, mindful eating is really just like, hey, I'm trying to pay more attention to how this food is making me feel, how I'm feeling in the moment. Um, and there is research out there. You know, it's it's hard to get causal research on this stuff, uh, as, as you may know, um, but that there is, are people who practice mindful eating, which is really just like focusing on your meal, no distractions, how it makes you feel, noticing the fullness, noticing the texture of the food, right? Not, not even just like whether you're full or not. Um, it, it can reduce stress, um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, research out there, like I said, that that can has shown that this does help in people who are 
diabetic. It helps them eat less, right? So that might be something that is helping you to keep your sugars lower, um, reduces stress around meal times, especially for people who are commonly dieting. It can be like a very stress inducing thing to get your food just right. So um, I think it can be a really good way to sort of like take the pressure off, right? And like you said, the the flat line thing can become this like thing that we want to grip really tightly and like be intense about. And that's, that's not uh, the goal. The goal is to do what our bodies need, feel our best, get better health, but also like ostensibly this will be every day, right? So being mindful about what you eat, trying to carve out that time for yourself, um, I think can be really helpful. It can be really helpful in managing stress, managing metabolic health can be a, certainly a piece of the puzzle to my mind. Yeah. And slow down and chew your food. Heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> all, all, th- all through all through growing up. But it is an interesting balance between right. <laughs> um between like, you know, uh focusing on data and then also just being present with food, right? And not not eating for an outcome as opposed to just eating in in and of itself. Um so yeah, an interesting balance that really I think <clears throat> we're getting more aware of in all of the in all of the health focused longevity space, you know, people um, you know, there's a lot more data out there now that at your fingertips about your overall health and it has, that data has its, um, has positives, uh, lots of positives, um, uh, but can also have negatives if you don't think about it in the right way and also just kind of like be present with what you're doing. So anyway, um, how about, no, uh, yeah, talk- I, I'm big on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talk to us about, um, some pitfalls that you see people making a lot when they're trying to improve their, improve their metabolic health through their diet. Yeah, I think uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head with us is is sort of the frustration of like, but I'm seeing a spike or I'm seeing an increase or I'm seeing um, the line isn't isn't totally flat. And it's sort of like we know that there's this is if you're wearing a CGM, obviously, we know that there is not, you know, not not a there's one way to achieve that. And it's by eliminating carbs from your diet. And again, most people don't want to do that. So it's kind of like a little bit of a letting go process there. I think also people are really used to uh, the diet lifestyle, right? This sort of like diet culture that we are in, which is like, okay, I'm going to do X diet. It's told me I'm going to get, get this, right? That outcome that we're talking about, like in X amount of weeks, I will have lost X amount of weight and I will be happy, right? We, we're all looking um, to that outcome. And I think, you know, this is again, like a little bit of a, a, a mindset shift, but that's uh, something that is not necessarily, we're, we're seeing a lot of people be disappointed by that as the way to achieve goals or end up in that yo-yo pattern. So I think like right. slowing down, which again, easier said than done. Um, and again, uh, the flat line, I think is, is a common pitfall as well, trying to just reduce as much as possible. And, and you will get certain things, right? You will get that flat line if you're cutting out carbs. But the second you introduce carbs again, you're going to see those glucose spikes. And especially after your low carb diet, you you might actually um, have a little like post keto or post low carb insulin resistance that can occur. So mm-hmm. I think that can be really challenging for people too. So um, trying to understand that peaks and valleys are going to happen. Um, rolling hills is what we call them. We, we want more of the rolling hills rather than the jagged peaks when we're looking at a at a glucose graph. And yeah, then just trying to be like, like anything, health change takes time. It took us time to get to where we are, right? If we're having metabolic dysfunction, that didn't happen overnight. And the reverse isn't going to happen overnight either, which I know is like not awesome to hear, but <laughs> it will work if we stick with it, right? So. So um, it, that reminds me a little bit of, um, you know, it reminds me a little bit of crash dieting, like the the same sort of sense of like getting obsessive about something and like doing that um, to the exclusion of anything else. And then, of course, what happens? Like there's the yo-yo back, right? Like to eating, eating whatever. And you could see how people might <clears throat> put on a CGM and then all of a sudden just get like up, super obsessed about it. And then the CGM's off and then they're back to they're back to um, their their prior life of eating whatever. So, you know, I think that <clears throat> that leans itself to what you guys are trying to do at Vary, which is um, which is to really enact long-term behavior change using technology. So t- tell us a little bit about that. How are, how are you guys envisioning, you know, Vary plays a role in this metabolic crisis that we have? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, I mean, just to, I know I'm broken recording a little bit here, but we, what you said about the spectrum is, is so, so true. And I think people are waking up to that a little bit more. Um, you know, they're realizing that, and this is not to discount medical professionals, obviously they have a very real place and are very, very important, but, um, you know, people are, are not getting what they are hoping for or want from a, from a doc, a traditional doctor visit, right? I have a high, A1C is pre-diabetic. What do I do about that? It's like, well, I don't really have time to tell you here's a pamphlet. Right. And it's like, I don't know what to do with this when I get home. So, um, yeah, yeah. Right. And again, it's like, it works until it doesn't, this is a crash diet sort of situation. But, um, yeah, I think like, again, with, with a CGM and with taking it into your own hands and with having an app, you know, it's like a lot of these, and even a lot of what we've talked about, a lot of these recommendations are pretty general, right? Like you, like you mentioned, it's like, cool, that can certainly set you on the right path, but this is going to help you use your bio-individuality and, and use what's happening on the day to day to, you know, sort of translate these insights about food and habits and show you what is working for you personally and what things aren't. And one of the ways that we have have recently sort of updated um, the feedback we're giving on food is that we have added this food quality element to um, the app. So you're logging foods, you're seeing your glucose response, you're getting a score based on your glucose response. But we also understand, right, we want to show you that tap inside to your metabolic health, but like glucose is, is one metric. And as we talked about in the beginning, there's a ton of them. There's a ton of data points. There's a ton of ways to sort of triangulate different components of your health. And this is a complicated topic. So trying to use that, that bio data with glucose, but also we're giving you feedback on what you've logged and like, Hey, you, you know, we call it like the French fry problem or the beer problem, right? We've typically had people who will like log those foods and they'll get a good glucose score because those foods, you know, alcohol can lower your blood sugar a little bit or French fries are really high in fat. It's like, but you logically know, like a diet of French fries isn't going to make you healthy, even if your glucose is flat. Right. So now we are giving you the feedback that's like, Hey, you might have had a good glucose response, but this is a poor quality food, right? So mm -hmm. we're using those nutrition databases to give you actual, the sort of combination of those two things. What is your glucose saying and what is the actual nu nutritive quality of this food and how is that going to help you? Because again, it's like, even if you have a metabolic um, health disorder, I'd rather, have a, I'd rather have you eat some berries, which I know are... Uh, nutrient dense and high in fiber and all those kinds of things, high in antioxidants and have like a little bit higher of glucose than the beer, right? Which may not affect right. your glucose, but isn't going to do anything for your long-term metabolic health. So that's a big um, component of things for us. And also um, the launch of our very program, um, which is again, combining, trying to help you understand all of the uh, components that you have control over the main ones that, you know, you talk about a lot on this podcast, or we've talked about, which are food, exercise, sleep, and stress, and kind of trying to work through those things, learn about those things and using the app, um, using goals within the app, work towards improving habits in those areas, um, for, for the longer term, right. For a better metabolic health. So kind of habit building and also using your bio data to see how you're progressing as you're building those habits is kind of what our program is about. Because ultimately what we're doing here is education, right? I mean, you know, you're absolutely you're training. This is a, this is a tool to train someone how to eat. Right. And it's, and it's using yeah. data to do that, which is, I think, it can be super helpful for a lot of people because you actually get immediate feedback, which is way quicker than the scale, right? Um, and you're also learning about the quality of foods, which is something that just, you know, a regular CGM is not going to give you, right? Like you might get some, you might get some feedback about like, you know, how you respond to certain carbohydrates. But as you mentioned, there's some situations where you might not get the glucose, you know, spike that you would normally because you've you know, without intention, hack the system by drinking with it or eating French fries, as you mentioned. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to teach people how to live ultimately without the device, you know, on their yes. arm, right? I mean, this isn't a long term solution. This is like, a let's get you trained up so that you're, you know, you're ready to go to war with with your diet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, ready to go to life, you know, <laughs> like ready to yeah, feel right, good, right. ready to reverse whatever whatever it may be. And, you know, I think the idea being like, sure, this can be something that you check in with every once in a while and what have you. But yeah, no, it's definitely not supposed to be the thing that like, well, now I have this indefinitely. This is to 
you know, like you said, benchmark yourself, understand where you're falling on that metabolic health spectrum and starting to get yourself to a place that like physically feels better, mentally feels better. And also like you can point to the data that is saying like, yes, I am. Things are getting better right inside. So, yeah, yeah. I'm total yeah. agreement with you. And the, I mean, the the quality of education from from these devices in my mind is is almost unparalleled compared to compared to other places that people can spend their time trying to learn about their health because you know even for the metabolically healthy people out there you still learn so much about how your body responds to certain food that you know otherwise there was just no data around like it's all subjective it's like do i feel bloated do i feel energetic do i feel sluggish like you know there's really these really subjective markers that you may or may not pick up on depending on how in tune you are with your body in the first place and then also because of all the other things going on but this allows for, you know, really direct data that is um, that's actionable and and delivered like instantaneously. So, yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember the last time I did not tell one of my patients that they needed to use a CGM for some amount of time, if nothing else, just for the education. Yeah, it's it's super insightful. And, you know, there's a lot of people who we have worked with or have, you know, used very who have again, I think I think, you know, there is once you can kind of let go, like we said, of that of that flat line thing. There's a lot of people who are have no metabolic health issues who have learned a lot about like their sleep or their stress, right? They're like, wow, I didn't realize that like this feeling I was feeling or this this um sort of response I was having um was stress due to like high blood sugar and it was occurring because of this, or I was my blood sugar was going up because of stress, and it really made me realize like just how much my um, mental or psychological stress was affecting me physically, right? I think that's like a thing we hear about all the time, but it's like hard to visualize or really see. So yeah, I mean, beyond just the the diet and the the metabolic health stuff, there's there's a lot of insights that you can kind of find about, again, like the way life and variables are affecting you and how you can kind of like better manage. And again, it's not about, it's not about getting it perfect, right? It's about being aware. It's about knowing where you can make the most impact. It's about like, hey, I'm not going to this is a food that actually works really well for me, or maybe this was something that I thought was great. And I don't, I don't need to do that anymore. So like, hopefully you're going to be able to like, make sure that the habits you're building are most useful to you and you're learning something about yourself from them. Totally. Totally. Well, what is, what's on the horizon for Barry? What, and let's, you know, research initiatives or, um, uh, you know, what, what do you guys have coming up for us in the future? Yeah. So, um, you know, this program, like I said, is, is launching like now, uh, we have a current, um, journey and app that users can follow, but we have a whole new sort of slate way. This is going to look, um, a lot of new true guiding goal features in the app that are, are super exciting. Um, we have some really cool stuff coming down the pipeline with, um, the way we are going to be, um, meal logging. There's some really impressive, uh, image recognition kind of stuff that we've, we've cool. got going on. And yeah, I think expanding to, um, expanding, uh, to a lot of like health clinics is going to be big on the horizon for us too. you know, places that are going to be able to say, Hey, like, we can show these to all our patients, right? I think getting getting the word out almost is like is like a, a big thing. But yeah, we're really excited about um, more of the educative launch, more of the in-app goals, more of the personalization of goals, right? Based on that mm -hmm. data um, mm -hmm. in app, so that people can just hone in more and more on exactly what they want to achieve and and what their body needs. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm excited to see. Excited to see the product. Um, it sounds like you guys have a um, an awesome mission. Um, obviously, a super super important area of health. Where can the listeners um, learn more if they're interested in learning more about Vary? Yeah, so Vary .com, Obviously, we have a blog um, that is Vary .com slash learn Vary .co slash learn. I'm sorry. Um, so that there's new blogs, you know, six plus a month that are pretty in depth. We got a lot of scientific writers who do some awesome stuff. Um, so you can dive deeper into some of the things that you're finding. Um, we're on Instagram as very, um, LinkedIn, you know, all, all of those kinds of places. Um, and we do have a newsletter too. So if you're interested in, um, signing up, being aware of, uh, any latest deals or anything like that, um, you'll get those, those, um, blogs and our latest podcast features, our latest, um, 
recipes, all that kind of stuff, direct to your inbox. All right. Emily Johnson, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been great talking to you. Mike, it's been wonderful. Really, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. If you're a Wild Health patient, you might not know, but you have access to our referral program. This gets your friends and family 25% off Wild Health services. Just head to Clarity, and in the top right corner, you'll see Refer a Friend. Click there, and you'll be brought to a page with your referral code. Happy sharing.